what was the greatest event to take place in the history of anything, of the universe. From the time God created till the times there is nothing as momentous as what is happening right here um, has ever happened. And it was the plan from the very beginning. Um, and it, it is just so powerful to me to watch God's perfect timing and his sovereignty in all of this that is undeniable. I, I mean, I think we do many times try to talk away the reality of the greatness of God and, his, and how, um, how we, really, we really don't control anything. <laughs> we, we really don't have any power. We really don't have any authority. He has it, and we can be doggone happy that he does. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and I, I love that because that's what I'm seeing more and more here. And as, as I do Luke on uh, um, Fridays, and they're kind of, they're kind of, they're, we're, in a, we're in a joining aspect here where we're in the same spot. And I'm seeing more and more, and I'm so profoundly aware of Christ's perfect control over this, as I said the last time. This is like a symphony that he's writing, and he's bringing in hundreds of parts of musical instruments, and they're all coming together to create the most beautiful piece of music ever written. And, and all of the people in the, that are playing the instruments actually think it's their symphony when it's like, no, no, I will, I will not only tell you when to join, I'm going to give you the power to join and play your part, and you don't even know it. You don't even know what's happening. Um, it, this, this is beautiful if we see it this way. And it should proclaim to us the greatness of God beyond anything we've ever seen before. That's why I said last time I was here, we cannot leave the book of Matthew thinking that this is all there is. This, this is world. We've got to see beyond that. It's got to move us to a place of eternity here because that's what's happening. If this does not create in us a mindset for a spiritual realm that is so real and so powerful um, and that we are such a part of, just like the disciples were, and in their, their humanness did not recognize it, we need to learn from that. They would want us to learn from that and join with them in history's most powerful event. And I really believe that we are in a place now in history where it's just as significant, well, almost as significant, the culmination of all that's happening right here, we're walking through it in history right now. And you know what? I want to play my part. I want to be one of the disciples. As stupid as I am, just like they were oblivious to what was going on, he still was able to use them in a most powerful way to where 2,000 years later, their voice is still speaking to us. And that's what I want to happen. I, I want, especially after some of the events in the last couple weeks of my life, I understand that legacies are significant. And that's what I, that's what I want to leave. I do not want to leave this planet without somebody knowing that God is real because I was here. That's, that's what the disciples did. And I don't know how God wants that to look. I don't know exactly how that happens, but I do want it to happen. And that happens by me submitting to him and saying, you are in control. I'm just an instrument in the symphony. You play your music through me. Make it real through me. So we see um, what I thought was so significant about these two chapters especially is that we don't want to miss. And I wanted to get these in, even though I have to go back and finish that other lecture. So I wanted us to pay attention to the, the parts that are happening here and the shift in, in Jesus' focus now as we get down to this last week of his life. And up to this point, we've been hearing a lot of parables, a lot of teaching, a lot of ministry, a lot of interacting with the crowds, a lot of revelation of who he is and his personal response to each one of them and what that means to them. But as we get to this last week of his life, he is thinking nationally with the nation of Israel. We, he is dealing specifically with their nation. If I was a Jew, holy cow, I would be paying attention to what's going on here right now. Because he is definitely speaking to them as a nation as he goes into this last week of his life. And we see that, and I want to bring this, this to your attention, especially in chapters 20 and 21 and on into 22. We start in chapter Matthew chapter 20, which is where I started a couple weeks ago. And um, we see that he gives this parable, in, starting in chapter 20, verse 1. And he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Okay, this is one of a series now of parables that he's going to give regarding the nation 
of Israel and their responsibility to respond to him significantly in ways other nations were not called to. So he is, he is, he's going to deal with them as people here. And, um, and he will go back to dealing with them once he's done with us as the Gentiles and uh, deal with them again. But right now he's kind of giving them these last parables to let them understand their position in all of this and to give them a warning again uh, to it all. So in chapter 20, he gives that parable of the kingdom is like a landowner and, um, and then the, the vineyard and his workers. That's a, that's a kingdom parable. That's a, this is my kingdom, God is the, the landowner, and you, were, you, the nation of Israel, were the ones who were supposed to read up, respond to this, and then he gives that parable. We can't go into the details of that, but that's what it was for. Then we have in chapter 21 a really huge significant event, and that is the triumphal entry, which it is never called that in scripture. I'm not sure why we give it that name, but I mean, tr I, I mean if you really were to think about what's happening here, um, it's, we, it, it won't end up to be triumphant in their minds. They think it is. This, is. this is how we really know that they are confused still as to what's going on. And they see themselves as a nation. They see their part in this so differently than what he's trying to express to them as their part was supposed to be. That's why he's giving these parables. But when he comes into um, Jerusalem for the triumphal entry, and every single thing that went on there, every detail within that very short period of time, was prophetic, and it fulfilled prophecy regarding the nation and what they were going to do with Messiah when he came. Every word he spoke, everything they did, pointed to him as Messiah, which you probably talked about in your groups. Hopefully, because that's what it was. The triumphal entry, we could spend a long time on that, but it's, it really just every, everything he said uh, looked like what they were expecting in Messiah. From right down from the colt, uh, coming into the city on a colt, why didn't he just walk in? Why did he wait till they brought him that colt? And again, I want you to notice that he knew exactly where the colt was. He knew exactly what the response of the owner of the colt would do when he asked for it. And it had to be a colt with, that had never been ridden on before because that fulfilled prophecy, which we only see in, um, I think it's Luke that, no, it is, Nancy, it is Matthew that actually says that. Luke does not give those, um, those prophecies. Um, so when I was teaching it in Luke, you wouldn't know that he was actually fulfilling a prophecy with riding on the foal of a, of a donkey. Unless you look at the map, you have to really parallel these because some of them say it, some of them don't. Um, and that's key because that's what they were expecting Messiah to do. So he's doing things and he's accepting praise in ways that only Messiah would do that. So they think in right rightly so because he's giving them all the impressions that Messiah has come and this is it. Your thousands of years of waiting are over and you are the generation that's going to see this happen. The problem is it's going to look different than what they expect. Ladies, if, if we ever, ever see anything out of this, we need to see that God will not do what you expect. Ever. I mean, that's just not the way uh, we, we can kind of, because if it's, if it's biblical, we can expect him to act bib biblically, but how he manifests that, never is going to be what we think it is. It's not going to be what we think it is. Because our minds are too feeble. We are too human. He does not work in that realm. So all of this, they're seeing on this human realm, the spiritual realm has to be going crazy right now. I, I, I just wish I could have had a picture as to what was going on in the spiritual realm when Jesus is coming in to pronounce himself as king, the problem is this is a spiritual kingdom that he's announcing himself king as, and all the people can't see beyond the donkey. They, 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 that's all they know is what's in the flesh. Two completely different kingdoms being ushered in in ways that they expected to happen one way, he expected to happen another way. It's going to be just a few days, and they're going to be saying, crucify him. Right now he's saying, how they're saying, Hosanna, the son of David. This is it. That, that phrase in itself is a messianic phrase. They were saying it because they thought he was the Messiah. And he was receiving it because he was the Messiah. It's just that very shortly they're going to see, wait a minute. This is not what we thought. And, and so all of that is so profound. The triumphal entry is so profound. Um, so we have that... Um, 
that part where he, the, in Matthew 20 where he introduces himself as the land over the laborers. Then we have the triumphal entry in verse 21, uh, uh, I mean chapter 21. And in verse, um, in chapter 21, verse 43, if I got this right, he makes this statement after giving this parable. Uh, he gives another kingdom parable in chapter 21. And then he says in verse 43, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom will be taken away from you and be given to a nation producing fruit of it. This is how we know that he's giving them specific <coughs> instructions about their nation. And he's, he's, right now, he's giving them parables that you, you have rejected me. You, looked, you just ushered me into Jerusalem like I'm the Messiah. But really, you have rejected me. You have rejected who I've really come to be. And he's telling them that. So these are all messian uh, messianic um, parables as well as prophecies of their response and what they're going to be held responsible for. So we have the landowners, the laborers in chapter 20, the triumphal entry, and then the parable of the landowners and the rebellion of the keepers of that. Then this in verse 43. And then in chapter 22... Um, it starts out with uh, Jesus answered and spoke to them in parables uh, saying, the kingdom of heaven will be compared to a king and a wedding feast. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. You see, this is, a, this, is a, this is a parable about their kingdom. And he's making it clear to them. And it's, it's very poignant to them. They, they should be able to pick this out. And they do. That's why they start to attack him. They, don't, they totally pick it out. So he gives this parable of the wedding feast with his son. And no one would come that was supposed to. So they had to... Uh, invite all these other people uh, that took, they took off the streets. I mean, if that's not as clear cut as it could get, I don't know what is as far as the kingdom of Israel rejecting their Messiah right now. See, so again, remember, in their mind, they just accepted him, right? They just walked him into Jerusalem shouting Hosanna. And he's giving them parables now that say, no, you just rejected me because you, you received me as the, the Messiah that you made up in your own mind. Like, I think we've, I think we've, built a Messiah in our own minds. I think we have expectations of what God should do. And, and he doesn't act that way. Kind of like, a, 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 like McKaylee with the, no, not McKaylee, her brothers as we're doing the uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Over and over and over again, the main thing is about, about Aslan, who is God. He's not a tame lion. They say that over and over again. He's not a tame lion. That's exactly how God is. You cannot put him in the box and tell him to jump through hoops and that this is the way it's going to be. That's not what he does. That's what he's making clear to them. So then, then we have in chapter two, uh, 22, verse 7. He says, he gives this parable of the, the wedding feast. And then he says in verse 7, But the king was enraged and sent his army and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. And he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Powerful statement. And the Jews knew what he was talking about. They understood this, and he's, he's telling them, of course, you have the religious leaders, they're the ones who knew who he was referring to, who are trying to shut him up because they don't want the people freaking out over this Messiah coming, and then the Romans responding, and we've got chaos going on, uh, is what's happening here. The whole thing is just out of hand. There's like two million people in a little in, tiny town of Jerusalem, and they're wanting Messiah to come? The Romans have got to be going crazy. We think people get hurt in riots around here? That they'll, they'll have to, to calm this down. Who knows who, who's going to get hurt? If they think somebody's going to try to usurp them like the zealots would do, this is a civil rebellion to them is what's happening. And they better put it down because Jerusalem is teeming with Jews right now. It's like a fire pot just waiting to be set off. So they're, they're freaking out because of that. And now he tells them that. And then we see, and we know this because then we can see in chapter 22, I, want you, I don't want you to miss this, that this is when they start to um, question him. This is when they, they step up and start to go, okay, we better do something about this guy um, and, and see if we can do something with him real desperate right now. We didn't want to do it during the feast, but holy cow, this is getting out of hand. We got to do something. So um, in verse starts at verse 15, chapter 22, verse 15, it says, then the Pharisees went and counseled together how they might trap him and what he said. So the Pharisees, are conspiring. How do we shut this guy up in the middle of the feast? This is this is crazy. Remember, they just said to him at the triumphal entry, what are you doing? You've got to stop your people. This is crazy. Do you, do you hear what they're saying to you? And what was his response? If they don't say it, 
rocks. The rocks are going to cry out. That's why we know he's walking in. It's not just their misunderstanding that he's coming as Messiah. He is coming as Messiah. He just knows it's a different Messiah than what they're expecting. So the Pharisees get together and start to work again against him. <laughs> then in chapter 20, 22, verse 23, it says, And hearing this, they marveled at leaving him and went away. And on that same day, Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, came to him and questioned him, saying, Teacher, so now the Sadducees, if the Pharisees failed, now the Sadducees are going to jump in. They're, they're enemies. And now they finally are working together for something. And that is to trip him up. So... They're desperate to try to stop him, so they come in and try to make him look bad. And then we have in chapter 22, verses 34 and 35, it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together, and one of them, a lawyer, that's a scribe, the lawyers are the scribes, comes to him, and they're going to try to set him up now. So you can see the desperation of the religious leaders. And what they're doing right now because of what he, he, is, he is proclaiming to be. And they are desperate to keep these people at a place where they can control them. And the only way they can think to do that is if we can trip this guy up. But he, this, this is what's so fascinating about this. They, they actually think that the one who set the universe into motion and spoke and it all came to happen, that you can trip him up. <laughs> Seriously, have you thought that through? I mean, that's just like a, a crazy statement. You just, you can't do it. You can't trip him up. Because you see, this whole thing, and I think I mentioned this before, and, and we don't want to miss this in this, especially in this last week of his life, but throughout his whole life, Jesus is timing everything and everybody right down to the minute. And I, I don't know that I'll get to do a lecture on it, but I hope when we get to that place, uh, we have to talk about the difference between what, a, what, what Passover day was for the Galileans and what Passover day was for the, for the ones that were in Jerusalem. There, there's two different times. Have you ever wondered, how does Jesus celebrate the Passover meal on Thursday night, and yet the people who killed him had to kill, kill him before they could celebrate the Passover meal on Friday? How does that happen? Because, the Passover, he, because Jesus is the Passover lamb. He will die at the exact moment that they kill the Passover lamb, but he's already eaten the Passover. How does that happen? Well, I can't go into that right now. So anyway, there is an explanation for that. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And, and what it does is it shows us that every single, this is what I mean by a symphony. The timing on this is so absolutely perfect. From the time he comes into Jerusalem, that's why he sent them ahead and then he went behind them. Because his, his timing has to be exactly right. He has to, he has to come into, into Jerusalem at exactly the right time. Nobody can get in his way. He's got he's to minister for that whole week. And yet he's got to pull the strings of those that are going to betray him. So that the timing is perfect. He's got to be arrested. He's got to be questioned. He's got to be beaten. All at specific times. And he's got to have the nail driven into his hand at a specific time moment so that he becomes the Passover lamb at the same time that they're killing the lamb in the temple. Exactly. Uh, do you know how many people are involved here? And he is orchestrating this whole event. So all these Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, they're all trying to trip him up. He's using every single, single thing that they're saying to him as part of his timing. And he's got, not only does he have to time it right, he has to make sure that they arrest him. And they have nothing to arrest him on. So he has to even give them what they need to arrest him. And when, when it's false testimony, he has to not say anything because otherwise they'd have to let him go. This is a set, he is setting everybody up. Perfect timing of the universe right now is going on. So can you imagine what is happening in the spiritual realm? He, he, guys, he's, he's so much more, he's more than what we can even imagine. If we think he cannot handle the details of our life, we need to take a second look at this. Because he, he I don't want to use the word manipulating, because he doesn't have to manipulate. He has designed this whole thing before the foundation of the world to happen minute by minute exactly the way he wants it to happen. To fulfill the prophecies that were given. That's how God is. And there is no human being alive or ever will be that can stop that. 
So in the midst of our political storm right now, take a breath and just go, God's got this. He has this right down to the last vote. He knows exactly what he's doing. And I tell you, we should not walk away from this not trusting him more. Not trusting him more. And then the other thing is, which I just want to, I have to throw this in here. We cannot walk away from this without understanding how hard evil tries to trip him up. Evil is so active right here. Evil is so prevalent. And what is so cool is the way that he brought about the, all the timing of this is he took that evil in his own hand and used it for his own good. That's what he was doing. The only thing he had to work with was evil. He's using it all. Right down to the last minute. Right down to the last lie of the last person who came and came, gave false testimony. Right down to the cowardice of the leadership that says, I find no pilots, I find no, I find no wrong in him. Right down to all of that. All of that evil, he's using it. It's, he's purposeful with it. Satan is not in control. Don't, I, I, we, we just can't miss that here. I don't, I don't know where that's going to go. It's going to go somewhere. Eventually. So anyway, all right, moving on. So you, uh, uh, what I originally started with this lecture was that I, I began to see that um, the, the disciples were just like everybody else, missing the whole point of this, right? So again, it's only by the grace and power of God that they are able to follow through with this plan and become the very people that he wants them to be. And it really won't even be until after it's all over and they see how stupid they were. And the Holy Spirit even does that because he gives them the ability to see what happened, what really happened. They, they, it, to me, it had to be like after when the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost, it had to be like waking up from a dream. And then all of a sudden going, wow, do you remember what he said here? Do you remember what happened? Do you remember what we did? And seeing it so differently now and recognizing that he was in control the whole time. Um, and that's, I, I don't think they see it. And I think that's kind of the state that we're in today. I don't think we understand who he is still. They didn't understand who he is. Thankfully, what I'm so, so I think is so cool is the fact that it doesn't matter whether they see it or not. He is faithful to bring them along the path because he has called them and is using them for his purposes. That's all we can do, ladies, is we want to present ourselves as completely useless, broken, unable, fearful, ridiculous people, and he turns it into a symphony. He turns our life into a symphony. We get to be a part of a symphony together. Only he can play that kind of music. We can't. We can't. And that's what's happening here, is that they did not see themselves for who they really were. All they were worried about was the power. Now, I was thinking about this the other night. I don't know, like 3 o'clock in the morning or something. And I was thinking, it's no wonder that when they were having the discussion about who was the greatest, when, you, when what we get, at least, from the scriptures as to who seemed to be the most significant, do you think it was Thaddeus that was thinking he was the greatest? <laughs> we don't even know. We didn't, some of them don't even know he was a disciple. Right? Who do we think? thought they were the greatest. Yeah, yeah, it was the ones that were right on the, I mean, seriously, we don't even, I start thinking about that. I have no idea who are the other disciples. I can't even name all the other disciples. Why would they be talking about who was the greatest? When any major event happened, who did, who was a part of it? Peter, James, and John, right? So you know that that had to be where some of it was. And whose mom was it that stepped up and said, hey, yeah, exactly. Can they be on the right? Because it was clearly obvious who the leaders of this group were. So we know the instigators of some of that, who's the greatest, had to be some of these guys. And they were. That's the problem. They were the, they were the ones that Jesus was going to use to do the job. But I think he's trying to make, us clear, make it clear to us that this isn't happening because of them. It's happening despite them. Right? We need to know it, this is happening despite us. Not because of us. There is no greatness in this. We can't touch this. With a 10-foot pole, we can't touch what's going on here. So for us to actually even think in the, in the realm of greatness, are you kidding me? I, 
I truly do see that Jesus had to even manipulate them to make it happen. And I'm sure after, once the, the, uh, the Spirit came at Pentecost, that's what, they were, that's what they had to say. Wow, how did he pull that off with us? And, and so I wanted us to look at really how privileged they were that they didn't know about until way later. And I want us, I wish, well, doesn't matter what I wish. Um, anyway, okay, so I wanted to very quickly, because I'm going to have to end here shortly. <laughs> yeah, right, funny. Okay, um, uh, he, they held a privileged position, that's what we covered first, and I gave the verses that talk about his promises to them and how privileged they were that they were going to sit on the 12 thrones. So yes, you are privileged. It's not going to look like what you think it's going to, but you are absolutely exalted over all these other people. I have a place for you. Um, and because I have chosen to use you, not because of anything you're doing, be, despite your idiocy and your, your cluelessness, I am going to exalt you. That's really what he's saying. Yes, that's exactly right. So the privileged position, and then I ended up, I went to the fact that talked about, he says, you're my friends, and I talked about, um, if you do what I command, we don't normally start a friendship by saying, you know what, I'll be your friend if you do everything I tell you. <laughs> and yet it worked here. <laughs> because clearly, to be God's friend means that you trust him to just do everything himself because we will do nothing but screw it up. And, and what a privileged position to know that he's going to take us and use us anyway and be our friend. Yeah. That's a privileged position. They didn't see it as that, but that's really what it was. So, and it says that, um, he says... Uh, down in the middle of that, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Is there anything in here that the disciples are doing on their own? Nothing. Nothing. This is completely God saying, I did it, you're mine, and that settles it. Because this has nothing to do with you. I chose you, I appointed you. And your father will give it to you. The word chosen there means to select, to choose for oneself, not necessarily implying the rejection of what is not chosen. So we're not looking at this as saying like an election for salvation. It is just that they had a job to do. He gave it to them. He enabled them to do it. And it was all about him making sure it happened through them. That's a, that's a privileged position. Uh, so uh, not implying rejection of what is not chosen, but giving favor to the chosen subject. Keeping in view a relationship to be established between the one choosing and the object chosen. Now, are you guys caught up on your notes now with that? Is everybody good with that? Okay. All right. Then the word appointed means ordained, where he said, I, I chose you and I appointed you. So I chose you means I selected you and gave you favor in this relationship, is what he's saying. And then I appointed you means to set, to put a place or person Put a, or place a person or thing. That means I picked you, and then I put you right here in this position, and I am working through you to do, despite all you guys do is fight about who's the greatest, I am, you are going to accomplish what I chose you to do. It, it really isn't about us, guys. We really have nothing. What is about us is that he wants to use us. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely mind-boggling. What a privilege. What a privilege. And I'm so glad to learn that he does it despite me. Yes. Not because of me, despite me. I love it. There's a chance, right? Yes. Yeah, that we can all be used in this. And that's what he's telling them. That's a privileged position when you're working with the God of the universe. Because, um, well, it's, I'll go on. I'm, 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 I got to stop there. Uh, and then the verse down below that, John 6, 70, Jesus answered him, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one is you, and one of you is a devil. I even chose that one. I even chose the devil. Purposefully. That's another one that he was manipulating right down to the minute. Right down to the minute he was using Judas. Now, I don't want you to get all weirded out about this whole... <laughs> uh, Debbie's already laughing. She's already weirded out about it. Don't. This is not where we're going. This is not what I want you to see here. I don't want you to get all... Um, well, they're just puppets. No, 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 no. But I don't have time to go into that right now, just like I don't have time to go into the Galilean Passover and the other one. But, but there's, there's reasons for this. It's not that God is just pulling strings and we're just a bunch of puppets here. No, they are accountable for their behavior somehow in the sovereignty of God using them. That's all I'll say for right now. But that we don't want to get lost on that. That's not the point here. 
So um, then it says, uh, I, I do not speak to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up the heel against me. Again, he's fulfilling scripture that was written thousands of years ago through Judas, and Judas thinks he's betraying Christ. No, <laughs> Judas, I'm fulfilling my plan through you. Okay, that's a different way of thinking. That we, we have to get here. We have to get here to where we understand that he chose us. We did not choose him. Now, and I'm not talking about, I'm not going all Calvinistic on you here. I'm just saying that this tells us that if we are his people, he has a purpose for us, right? In the grand scheme of things. How that works itself out, we're not going to discuss right here theologically or doctrinally. It's just the reality of written right here. You cannot deny what's here. He has a program, and if we want to be a part of it, he will use us to do that. Okay? So, uh, the second privilege is that they received privilege information. And I really liked this um, uh, it, because really it even relates back to the Matthew 13, uh, when he, when in, his, in these verses here, right before he, this, he gives them the parable of the sower. And we talked about the parable of the sower, right? What he's saying to them right here is that they happen to be the seed that he threw on the fertile ground so that it could bear fruit. The seed doesn't choose which ground it goes on. <laughs> he put them there because he needed them to bear fruit, right? So I just wanted to throw that in because it's, this is said right at that same time of the parable of the sower. And then he says, because they go, why are you always talking parables? And he says, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Notice that it's been granted. It's been given to them. This wasn't your idea. This is mine. And it's a privilege. But to them, it has not been granted. Ladies, we ought to be jumping up and shouting up right now. If God has revealed himself to you, it is a privilege beyond comprehension. And yet many times, and that was the main point I wanted to, to do on this, which I'm not going to be able to do. And that is that sometimes we look at this, instead of being a privileged disciple, we looked at it as being a burden slave. That's what we think it is to, to have to walk with him. Oh, I have to be kind when other people aren't. And I have to love my husband when he's a jerk. And I have to, you know, do all these things. I have to help people when they're hurting. We think that's, that's a burden. I, I just have, no. We've been exalted beyond all comprehension that the God of the universe wants to create in us what we were created to be. When there's people out there that won't be. Anyway, I can't go any further on that. I wish I could, but I can't. Okay. So, um, for who, uh, it has been granted to you to know the mysteries. For whoever has, to him shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance. Notice this is all about what he has has been given. There's nothing there that, he, that they get on their own. Again, notice the verbs here. There be, it's being given to them. This is passive. This is not active. They're not actively doing it. It's passively being given to them. So the word granted means to give or to bestow upon. The mysteries, this is a part I love too, that they don't even know they're getting. And they won't know the reality of it fully for a long time, but they will know more of the reality of it once they have the Holy Spirit that comes at Pentecost. And that, remember how many times he told them that. You're, when I, I, I'm telling you this now so that you'll know later, because you don't get it right now. But he says, a, a mystery is a person initiated into sacred mysteries. It denotes a spiritual truth couched under an external representation or similitude or and concealed or hidden thereby unless some explanation is given. Which really what this is saying in common language is you don't have a clue you even have it. That's really what this is saying. That's what this mystery, uh, mystery is. You've been initiated to some spiritual truths that unless I reveal to them, you don't even know you have it. And that's what they got. They got to be a part of that. And remember, he said there were, there were prophets and people who wish they could, only wish they could see what you guys are seeing right now. Yeah, angels. They, they wish that they could comprehend or be given what you, you've been given. You see, all the disciples worry about is who's the greatest? Which throne am I going to sit on? That's us. That's who we are. We don't understand what we've been given. Boy, if we ever tap into that, we're going to be just like them at Pentecost. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Uh, then the third one is that they obtained a privileged testimony. 
And he says to them in Matthew 13, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Privileged position. Right now, when Jesus is going to be arrested, I kind of doubt the disciples see this as a privileged position. Now, walking into Jerusalem, when everybody's shouting Hosanna and they're being lifted up as he's great, uh, a part of the king here, the Messiah, they're thinking, this is great. This is, this is kind of what I was counting on. But boy, is that going to shift fast. That was, that's going to shift fast. And we don't want to miss that. We don't want to miss the fact that they misunderstood what it means. The privilege is there. We just have to see it correctly. If we distort that privilege, it becomes a work of the flesh. All right, so they, they obtained a testimony. And, of course, that testimony is why we're even here today. Because that testimony was written down in Scripture. That's the testimony that they got to do. John 17, 6 and 8. I manifest my name, thy name, to the, this is his prayer for the disciples and for us. To the men whom thou gavest me out of the world, thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they, they have come to know that everything thou hast given me is from thee. For the words thou givest me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from thee, and they believed that thou didst send me. Now, you tell me, do you really think the disciples are acting like they really get what he's saying? No, Jesus is just saying, no, they have all the information. It just hasn't been woken up in them yet, but it's there. It's there. They do have what's going to take. Because when the, when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, it's going to all fall into place. And they're going to get it all. Because I've given them exactly what you've given me. And when you're ready for that, that seed to bear fruit, it will. It's there. It's there to bear fruit. That's really what he's saying. There's nothing in here about them. It's what the Father has done in them and how Jesus followed through with that plan. And it will come to fruition. Okay, here she comes. I'm late. This is not good. And I, I do want to just throw one thing in here. I want you to see, and I don't know when, but I, I, we've got to talk about this. It says, and they believe that thou didst send me. Why did he send him? I think this is, this is what we get a little bit confused about. And this question has to be investigated to its full extent, because I believe we have been deceived. We think we know. But he came, he was sent, not so that we could have heaven. Not just because he loved us. All of those reasons. Not just so that he could work through the nation of Israel. Not just so that he could change the world. He came to conquer sin. He came to conquer sin. He came to crush the head of the serpent. We don't get that, ladies. We don't get that. And we need to get that. We need to understand, as I said several weeks ago, really what sin is. We're living like sin is some kind of a fantasy. And I'm telling you, it is not. If I know anything this day from the last several months, I know more than ever the reality that sin is a real, active, destructive, life-stealing agent and we have been put here to follow through, to fight it. And we're not doing it. We're embracing it. Satan's duped us. And we are working most of the time for him. <clears throat> Frightening thought on my part. I, I, but we've got to come to grips with this. I don't know what this is going to look like, but I will not let this die. I will not let this go. I feel like this is a message that I, it has to, we have to come to grips with this. because. The blinders are killing us. And we are playing into his hands. And I hate him for that. And we cannot stand for that anymore. I, I, I'm sorry. I have to leave you with that. <laughs> but that's the truth. And we will. We will. Somewhere. Go pursue it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that your word is so powerful. For Jesus, your life, there's so much more to it than what we get. Forgive us for being so blind, just like your disciples were. Thank you that you love us despite ourselves. Thank you that you use us despite ourselves. Thank you that your plans 
will come about. Thank you that we are so privileged, so privileged to be a part of it. May we be faithful and may we bear fruit. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.